Reality check. The ecosystem has never been more unbalanced and unpredictable. It's become harder than ever for businesses to deliver sustainable, durable growth. It's even tougher when many of the partners you once relied on have become hard to trust. Stuck in survival mode, taking forced shortcuts, hindering an enduring business. We're tired of empty promises and unstable agreements. We're skeptical of short-term incentives and biased practices. There has to be a better way for the seller, the buyer, and the user. We believe for deep-rooted growth, you need a reliable foundation. We believe for a thriving future, you need support and rebalancing efforts today. We believe to charter a sustainable course through today's hyper-competitive, fast-changing world, you need to build for the short term and the long term. We believe in proving our worth and making a difference to your business. Working hard and caring more by putting your success first. Being provocative partners, acting with radical candor, not vendors with cookie-cutter products and services. We believe in creating a relevant alternative in a space dominated by a duopoly. We believe in shared values, respectfully challenging one another to be better, in earning, not buying, our and other success. We believe in resilient visionaries who think bigger, with their heads up and eyes open. And we believe it's time to elevate your game. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Ellis Hill. Um, today's conversation will dig in on ad strategy in the age of acquisitions and consolidation. Um, this is a great session for those of you considering incorporating consolidation into your long-term monetization strategy, or if you're curious about how large companies think about this path to sustainable growth. I'm on the MoPub client services team, and I have the privilege to work with some of the largest and most influential publishers in gaming. My guest is Phil Su, the Senior Director of Ad Monetization and Product at Zynga. Phil has 10 years of experience in ad monetization and product, and has led Zynga's ad strategy through some of its most exciting initiatives and on to exponential growth. I can't think of a better industry leader to talk to about how ad strategy has transformed and what's coming next. Thank you so much for spending the time today, Phil. Thanks, Kate. Uh, great to be here. Um, so to kick things off, Zynga has a really well-publicized strategy of acquiring studios to help power its growth. Some acquired studios already have ads and run on a variety of platforms, and some don't have ads at all. What do these studios with very different setups have in common, and what makes them attractive? Yeah, I think, you know, when we're looking at acquisitions in general, there's definitely a lot of different considerations, and ad monetization is but one component. Uh, focusing specifically on that, it, we look at several things, kind of the, of course, the ad revenue, what is the opportunity, existing opportunity, and and what is the opportunity for growth? You know, how, how big do we think it can grow? And then it's also looking at, you know, the platform and the people, you know, is the, are the, the, the titles complementary to Zynga? Are they bringing something unique? Uh, so when we kind of start to do that, when we look at the titles and can deconstruct all of their existing placements, and see, you know, what, what are the genres? What are the, the ad units that they have in? Is it optimized already or is there future opportunity um, if we can partner with them to help uh, grow their ad revenue? And, uh, you know, we will talk about, we can talk further about that a little bit later. And, uh, you know, when we build kind of revenue models uh, to, to predict, to kind of forecast what that would be or what it could be. And that gets refined over time. Uh, during our conversations, we can be looking at, you know, what platform they have uh, and what technology. Is it, you know, mediation, who they use, 
Do they have any of their own first party technology? Uh, you know, what, what are the networks and partners and that they that they have integrated? You know, kind of what is their geo mix and penetration? Right? How does how is that uh, different from Zynga potentially, and their experience around that? Do they have a sales team? Uh, so are they? You know, do they also have direct sales, or is it mostly um, just network operations? And then. You know, really, a big important aspect of it is the team. Is it is uh, do they have a lot of experience with ads or not? Do they uh, is it more of an afterthought in the game, and they're really focused more on IAP, and they have some part timers kind of handling it, or is it a dedicated team? So, what are their experience and capabilities? And you know, during the diligence process, uh, we we learn too. You know, it's kind of a it's a conversation, a relationship, a partnership between us and these other publishers and. Um, and, and we learn and it's always interesting. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of interesting learnings, especially over the last year as, as this is all ramped up for you guys. Um, building on this a little bit, um, are there other benefits that people might not naturally think of um, for expanding your portfolio? Yeah, our, you know, it's something pretty exciting. And I think our, our CEO, Frank, has talked about it a number of times already now. And it's, it's kind of the opportunity for cross promotion and building out our own network within our portfolio of games. And, you know, that when we look at acquisitions or even our own games, now we, we look at ad inventory in a different way. Uh, because it's now the availability of ad supply takes on this new dimension because it's a way to drive uh, cross promotion across games. And, you know, through the advertising now, you know, other publisher, other buyers and advertisers are, you know, buying installs from our games. Um, you know, we should be able to do it as well and do it better. And, you know, how, how can it be better? Uh, leveraging our own first party data to improve, you know, targeting and retargeting within our portfolio, especially when IDFA goes away on iOS 14, you know, we're going to have that um, internally within the network. Um, and that's a competitive advantage. You know, another thing is you know, we'll be able to acquire users for a lower CPI potentially in one app and then cross promote to games with higher um, CPIs, which is also a benefit. And, uh, you know, once you acquire a user into the portfolio, it can be anywhere. Uh, you can retain them within the network and increase that LTV of that user and potentially the uh, ROAS of you know, user acquisition. Uh, so it becomes a little bit of a multiplier. And, you know, as we think about the, the scale, the bigger the scale uh, uh, of the portfolio, so it, it enriches it, but also the breadth. So, you know, the, the more genres and kind of the breadth of the portfolio that we have also makes it um, more valuable. Yeah, the, the cross promotion piece is a, a really great point. Um, so we've discussed Zynga's large and diverse portfolio of games, which means working with a variety of studios. Um, what has been the most effective way of engaging those studios to grow ad revenue? This is an interesting one. I, I think, you know, as our business has grown and the number of studios that we have has grown, we really look at um, measuring ourselves as a B2B business, right? When you have dozens of studios, you know, they, it takes on a kind of different, uh, different perspective. And it's more of like a BDN sales process uh, around building relationship and trust. And uh, over time, I've kind of thought about it as an account management model, you know, similar to uh, our, you know, our partner demand partners like yourself. And, you know, where we have kind of support staff um, specifically for studios to kind of help them navigate and provide information and communication, uh, as well as kind of technical and product support. And so to help kind of over time work with the same people, everybody knows who to talk to and where to go for things and that we're responsive and, um, and that, you know, they get a, over time you build a sense that they, you know, that we know what we're doing. So that, uh, that building that trust allows for uh, us to kind of build on that for, you know, initiatives and opportunities in the future. 
Uh, when I look at it, there's kind of like two different ways. It's, it's more the games that are live in, in maintenance where we, um, you know, build that trust over time and then can leverage it to uh, grow opportunities. So, you know, we've been successful. Let's say even with declining DAUs, you're able to increase uh, average revenue per user and grow revenue, even in a situation where say DAU would decline. Uh, and that's, you know, a testament to kind of how well we've been working with our internal studios. And, you know, for kind of the newer opportunities, um, it is very much kind of a new business kind of process, right? We'll have multiple conversations. There'll be pitch decks. Uh, we, we come in with um, data and different comps to, to genres. So, you know, are you a, a casual game or a mid hardcore game? You know, what are the kinds of ad units and ad placements that games like this have had within Zynga and outside of Zynga? And we bring in kind of our design recommendations and, and best practices. And, uh, and then go through a, a process to kind of uh, develop what that ad strategy is. And, you know, data is important, uh, especially for analytical types, uh, you know, who are in product and tech, typically data, you know, drives decisions. And, and also, you know, at the end of that data funnel, you get to revenue <laughs> and, and, and money talks usually. Um, but, you know, in some cases, it's, it's not like that, right? Like if I could throw as much data and money at you and, and you'll be kind of still hesitant and resistant. Uh, and, you know, in, in some cases, uh, a little bit extra in terms of, you know, creative assets and uh, it, within the deck and kind of being able to visualize the experience instead of just conceptualizing it, right? Oh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what this is gonna be like and you have to conceptualize it in your game. You can do that, but it's a lot more powerful to actually see it on the screen. So uh, when we are able, we can kind of do that and you know, invoke a little bit of an emotional response and say, oh, okay, yeah, like, that doesn't look that bad, or that's like pretty nice. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't mind that in my game. So that's, you know, that so you have to just get them to yes, get them over like, all right, fine, we'll put ads in. Um, or yeah, like some people are excited about, hey, uh, that's awesome. Like, let's, let's put that in there. And so then we can, you know, once you get over that hurdle, initial hurdle, then we come together to set the uh, ad strategy and the goals the studio is looking to achieve. That's a great mindset for your teams to have. Um, clearly, it's paying off. Um, when it comes to ad strategy with new studios, you talked about um, you know some of the the tools you use to engage them. But what are the top two or three areas of evaluation once um, they are migrated over? How do you measure their success? Yeah, so, you know, when we're kind of defining the ad strategy and setting the goals, I mean, the, the first benchmark is ARP DAO, so average revenue uh, per user per day. And it's really the North Star metric. Uh, and, you know, under, and it's the easiest to kind of compare across genres, they're, they're relatively consistent. Um, and, you know, under ARP DAO, kind of what drives revenue is both uh, supply and demand. And that's gonna be, and kind of how we do that is, is gonna be different um, based on the genre again, and what ad units you put in. You know, so, so casual games can have more like display and you know, mid to hardcore games or IP heavy games are, are really more focused on rewarded video. And so we looking at specifically, you know, starting with supply, uh, we look at, just benchmark CPMs so that we can focus on supply because supply is driven by the ad placements uh, in the game and you know where those ads are showing up. And the goal of, of that is to generate volume of impressions because supply is really based on how many ads you're showing to the users um, and in what ways. And you know, and uh, you know, volume versus kind of the level of comfort on the user experience. Uh, that the team is comfortable with. Uh, and we'll see kind of how that comes into play in a bit. The, now there's kind of like two types of placements that we kind of group things into. Uh, one has to do with generating reach uh, and the other is more generating engagement. So, and it's great to actually have a mix of both, but it's also, you know, kind of what the studio is, is looking for. 
Uh, the placements that generate a lot of reach are uh, things like the daily reward bonus, things like that, where, or it's in the lobby or a HUD that pretty much everyone sees, but engagement might be lower on that, like the click-through rates and view-through rates on that might be a little bit lower, uh, as opposed to something like a desperate buy, which, you know, is going to be surfaced to less people, but they're going to click like the the rate at which you click on that and, and, and watch that video is gonna be a lot higher. And you can achieve the same goals, but obviously if you have a mix of both, you're gonna hit um, the highest overall, we call use rate, which is the, the number of users that engage with ads. You're gonna be able to maximize that because some people um, do both. Some, you know, some users, players do both. Some really come in every day to Re, you know, get some bonuses on their rewards, and some people about. <laughs> you know, are never gonna, yeah, or, yeah, and and some people are never gonna convert on IAP, and they kind of want that opportunity for like a desperate buy, and you know, uh, especially in those cases, it probably helps with retention a bit. Uh, so you know, those two kinds of of ad type of kind of placement types, and then when we think about that, we also look at the the ad funnel. Right, because this is probably a really a, the most important thing when we're talking about supply, is there's there's multiple. It's not just hey, there's a user and hey, we watch the ad. Um, there's a lot of decisions along the way that people get tripped up on, and you know you start with DAU, and then uh, you know the next step is like eligibility, right? And in I think in the in previously in prior years you have uh, a lot of the uh, studios kind of say, oh, we'll never show ads to payers. Like we don't want to show ads to people unless they've been playing for 60 days. And so you really cut off a lot of users just right off the bat. Uh, and you know, I think that mindset has changed a lot over the years um, in, in a positive way. And so eligibility has kind of like shifted, but that's still you know there. You cut off people right at the top with eligibility. Um, then the next thing is surfacing, which really the, you know, the reach and engagement kind of starts ticking in. And, you know, if you show an opportunity to everyone versus burying it somewhere deep, um, sure, that might have a lot of engagement, but if it's buried too deep and only 10% of your users see it, then, you know, the opportunity is going to be really small. So then, you know, studios will say, why? why is the revenue so small? <laughs> well, you're only showing it to 10% of your users. Uh, and then, you know, after that, after you show it to, you know, surface the opportunity to the user, then it's a, a measure of engagement and kind of what, you know, how enticing is that for the user? Even if it's a daily bonus, you know, is it like a 10% increase? Is it a 50% increase? And this is where some of the ad strategy kicks in. Is it something that you want users to engage with a lot? or do you want a high percentage of your users to engage with it? So you, even with a daily bonus, you can generate 80% uh, you know, um, engagement, right? If it's a super valuable bonus, right? right? Um, and, and maybe you, li you really limit it uh, as, <clears throat> as opposed to uh, something that it's very liquid. And, and so, you know, oh, well, you expect them to do it eight times. So the value of each time is not, that much, but if somebody's willing to grind through it, you're, you're gonna give them a, a decent amount. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's where engagement and, and repeatability come in. So after, you know, oh, hey, a certain percent of your users who see it are gonna engage with it. And then how, how much are you gonna allow them to do it? How, or how, are your, how much you're gonna drive them to do it um, is the rep repeatability aspect. So yeah. then, you know, when we look at, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Please continue. And, yeah, and then the kind of when, when how we measure all that is how we measure the health and success of you know your ad funnel is, is really around um, volume and, and your reach. So kind of saying, hey, like is your are your is your ad implementation healthy? Is volume and reach? Volume being kind of impressions and impressions per user, and then your reach being uh, viewers. So as viewers and viewers as a percent of DAU, and then how many ads per view being watched. So, you know, with all this in mind, we kind of come in with our own uh, design recommendations to the studio. And, 
and then have a conversation with them over time. And, and uh, then the studio is going to come up, assuming, you know, they're already on board. They're going to have their own design concepts and specs that they bring to the table afterwards. And then it's a conversation because, as I said, they, you know, oh, okay, we, we want it like this. And then we'll say, well, I'll either confirm or have feedback that, okay, you, you know, you, you want to put this in your game, but your goals are here. There, you know, you're not going to achieve, you know, the, through the funnel, you're not, we don't think you're going to achieve, you know, your ARPDAO goal with the, the implementation that you have in mind. So then we kind of have to go in and tweak, uh, you know, what, what that's going to look like. Oh, uh, yeah. All the back and forth there. <laughs> Um, so the other side of ArpDAO is, you alluded to this earlier, but um, is demand. So how do you think about what demand sources you integrate into a game or, or as you're having these uh, conversations with studios, uh, who to pitch to them? Yeah, and that's, uh, yeah, the other side of, you know, the of ArpDAO, as we said, was demand. And, you know, demand drives the yield that we get. Um, so the, you know, the revenue per impression, and that's also kind of informed by the ad strategy. And when, when we look at the, the drivers of demand, it's uh, several different things, actually. It's um, the demand partners themselves, uh, operations regarding that. So like pricing and block lists, and then are the initial configuration or the infrastructure that we put in. And so let, let's starting with the, you know, configuration, what that means. So for Zynga, we kind of have three different possibilities. All right. And one is we have our own, you know, first party um, SDK and ad server that wraps all the networks. Uh, it comes with a lot of out of box features uh, that help to, you know, make it easier for games to integrate and, and uh, manage kind of the ads business. Uh, it has a lot of tie-ins to other central services like experimentation and reporting and things like that. So, um, you know, a good portion of our portfolio has that integrated, but for, you know, one reason or another, they don't, especially um, if you're, you're not using um, all of our central services, say, for instance, or um, we want to use it as a test bed to to uh, be able to kind of switch out networks faster, we might do a direct uh, mediation implementation. So some studios uh, are directly in with, you know, the mediation service and uh, the, the uh, some other underlying networks. And then kind of the third configuration is just a direct to one partner integration. And, you know, and when we think about that configuration, like what people use, it really has to do with the pers a lot, really mostly uh, what percent of ad rev like that game is uh, expecting to, to derive. So if you are uh, a game that's, you know, never, you know, ad rev is only going to be 2% ever, you know, or two to 5% really low and they don't really want to deal with it and it's on autopilot, you know, and um, they don't want to maintain it, uh, but they, but they still want, like a rewarded video feature in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's when you might go, you know, direct to one partner and, and make it eat and really kind of make it easy to, uh, to have like low maintenance costs and really to have the, it just for a feature for, for the users. Mm -hmm. uh, and as opposed to kind of the other two. Uh, so you know, assuming now that we're, we have mediation right? Like what are the networks? What are the partners and demand sources that we put in? Uh, and that is also kind of dictated by, you know, the ad strategy for the studios in terms of, you know, do they want features that generate a lot of fill or higher yield? And I alluded to it a little bit before uh, when we we're talking about supply, but is it like a feature that, you know, you're expecting uh, some, you know, people to engage with a lot Right. So, hey, uh, I'm going to give them a daily bonus and they can click on that like six times in a row. And so therefore, you know, fill is actually really important. And I don't want my users to get frustrated that like there's no ads available or they have to keep like coming out and going back in. And uh, as opposed to something, say, that's really high value and they only expect users to watch like you know, one to two ads a day. And, but the, each time they watch it, it's really high value and they have whatever, 70, 80%, you 
you know, view through rate on that or something. So, uh, so that is going to kind of dictate potentially what partners that we put in, you know, there's some networks are better at kind of really driving performance and it's, uh, you know, they'll always have an ad available for you. Uh, and, and they, uh, and they'll really fill, but the, the average yield will be lower. Uh, and some networks are, kind of, oh, we only have like a couple ads for you, but they're going to be good. Or we only care about these specific users we want to target, but we're going to pay a lot. So, you know, they, um, so we have to, we think about that mix. Uh, Geo also matters a lot, kind of where the the player base is for this game. Uh, kind of also dictates what networks that we have. And we typically start with, you know, hey, these minimum three, we have like our core three partners that we're basically going to put into every game. And then outside of that, you know, these other considerations start to um, take effect. And then, you know, once we you know, decided what partners that you put in, right, then it's how we run it. And that's kind of the operations of it. So the pricing and how we optimize that is, is going to impact demand, but um, also the kind of how, how much we, we block. So that's also kind of dictated by the ad strategy in terms of, you know, we want to really preserve the user experience. I don't want, you know, uh, you know, I want a really tight block list on competitors, right. Or competitors or whole genres, right. That those, those like the more you block, right. The, the lower your yield is going to be. <clears throat> so, you know, some, some studios really want to protect that and, and are, probably some of our demand partners know we, we probably have some of the most ex, uh, pr pretty high block lists in, in certain cases. And, uh, you know, also for user experience, like, you know, some games are okay with a double close with a timer <laughs> or ad after ad, yeah. uh, and, and some games are not. So those kinds of things also determine, you know, what we're going to block and what we're going to allow, which uh, also impacts you know, some of the, the demand side. I I think that especially the network piece um, is really interesting because intuitively some publishers may think that the best approach for all studios is the one that they use for the apps that made them successful in the first place. But uh, a successful consolidation strategy sounds like it's a lot more nimble and customizable than that. Um, it, you talked about this a little bit before, um, but some of your acquisitions have been for apps that don't have any ad presence whatsoever, like nothing, all IAP. Um, so what what would be the first thing that, that you would do with an acquired studio that has no ads and maybe resistant to putting that in the mix? Yeah, the, you know, it's when we engage with a, a new studio, it's, it is about building that opportunity uh, and trust. So, or just kind of defining the opportunity and building the trust. And, you know, when we define the opportunity, you know, again, it's, it's, we're bringing data, we're bringing our, our comps to their genre and revenue projections and, and scenarios. It's like options like, Hey, you kind of take this low touch approach and like get low a menu. Cost and it's going to get this. Exactly. It's like, these these slates of implementation, how deep the implementation is, and then the costs associated and saying, all right, like this is kind of, you know, the opportunity from a revenue perspective and a cost perspective. Um, and, and, you know, that, and that's more defining the opportunity, but, you know, the other side of that coin is uh, the trust aspect. And, you know, we, we talk about, we provide an overview of, of Zynga's you know, ad monetization business, uh, our management and our resources and the teams and support that we have for the studios. Uh, go over the integration process. Um, it's quite long actually, but, you know, to give a sense of what's all involved. And then, you know, we also want to understand their concerns uh, and, and their perspective on, on how they think about ads. Because uh, e even before you're working on the ad strategy, you know, maybe they had experience with ads in the past in their game or, and they took it out or mm -hmm. they, um, you know, they play uh, usually, you know, game makers play a lot of other games and they had bad ex ad experiences in other games and, and they don't want it for there. Uh, it, maybe it's, you know, super IP heavy game with very high 
uh, ArpDAO for you know IEP and they're worried about cannibalization or retention um, or the user experience. So you know with ads and so kind of like just understanding where they're coming from and and what their concerns are and then trying to address those and have a conversation and and sometimes you know you, you will won't get over that hurdle per se but that's you know maybe where the trust kicks in and mm -hmm. uh you know, over time you can can build that where they okay maybe you know i'm all my misgivings are not answered but yeah. but all right like we'll we'll like give it a shot and you know you start small Right, you know, rewarded video is the easiest thing to get in. I think it's the, more of the a gateway ad. ad. Yeah, it's a gateway ad. Uh, it's uh, you know, you know, more proven uh, format. It's user opt in. It's mm -hmm. and um, you know, a very kind of high value per view. Uh, and so you, you almost look at it like a micro transaction uh, per se, and you know that it's easier for studios to, to put in rewarded videos. So you can start off small, see how that goes. And, you know, over time, uh, increase the, the, the surfacing and the optimization and experimentation around, you know, existing or new placements in reward video. And then, you know, probably the easiest one to go to after rewarded video is interstitials, maybe for users that have kind of been in the game a long time and never converted and you can start introducing interstitial. So you can, yeah, over time, you can optimize and add new placements in different ways. Uh, but you know, it, the, it's always hardest to get over the hurdle to one. Uh, mm -hmm. and then <laughs> you can build that from there. That. Yeah. So can you share with everyone tuning in today, your top three takeaways? Uh, yeah, kind of in summary, I would say, you know, three things are uh, you know, a portfolio strategy in gaming does more than give you a large catalog. It also allows you to derive additional value uh, across your entire network of apps. Uh, second, you know, for centralized ad teams working with studios um, is a really long-term relationship building process. Um, and, and that trust will kind of bring success in the long-term. And you know, a third uh, successful studio ad strategy is centered around ARPDA goals and that drive decisions across uh, both supply and demand. Uh, well, thank you so much, Bill. Um, provided a lot of great takeaways for publishers looking to build out a portfolio strategy. Um, I think from managing studio relationships to choosing the right network mix, there's a lot that can be learned from the strategies that you employ. Uh, really appreciate your time today, and I can't wait to see what Zynga gets up to next. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me.